Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be doing an NCLEX review over peptic ulcer disease. This video will be part one of a two-part series and in this video I'm going to concentrate on the complications, the signs and symptoms, and the pathophysiology of peptic ulcer disease. And in part two, I'm going to be really hitting on the nursing interventions and the medications. So be sure to check out that part. And as always, in the YouTube description below or at the end of this video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on peptic ulcer disease. So let's get started. Okay, first let's start out talking about what is peptic ulcer disease. Peptic ulcer disease is ulcer formation in the upper GI tract that affects the lining of either the stomach, so the ulcer can be located in the gastric area, so it's called a gastric ulcer, or it can be located in the duodenum, and it would be referred to as a duodenal ulcer in this area right here or sometimes they can be located in the lower part of the esophagus. But for this lecture, we're gonna concentrate on gastric and duodenal ulcers. Now, why do these ulcers form? Well, what happens is that in your stomach, you have gastric acid, and um, gastric acid is a good thing because it digests that food that we take in liquefies it and sends it throughout the lower part of the intestine to be digested. Well, what happens is that um, this gastric acid along with pepsin and the breakdown of the defense mechanisms of your stomach that keep it protected from that acid start to break down. And um, the, protecting line, the protective lining of the stomach can start to erode due to those digestive juices. So um, if you have an increase in stomach acid and a decrease in stomach defense, that is just perfect conditions for a peptic ulcer formation. Now, before we dive into the pathophysiology of peptic ulcer disease, let's go over the basic anatomy that we need to know for this condition because it's going to help us with medications, nursing interventions, and everything like that. Okay, so here we have the stomach. It's like a pouch area. And the role of your stomach is to liquefy food by churning it. And it also churns it, but it uses those digestive acids to break down that food. So here you have your esophagus, which food will enter in down through the esophagus into your stomach where those gastric acid and juices will break down that food. Then it'll go through the duodenum. And here, in between your stomach and your duodenum, you have the pylorus. And the pylorus is like a muscle-like structure that allows that food to, in a sense, get squeezed down into that duodenum so it can do its job. And I want you to remember the pylorus because with peptic ulcer disease, um, especially a duodenal ulcer, the pylorus um, from chronic ulceration can become scarred and lead to obstruction and things like that. So keep in mind where the pylorus is located. Now, your stomach is made up of several layers. And let's go over those layers because we need to know what's in um, some of the layers to help us know which cells secrete which acids. Okay, so that inner layer that lines your stomach, the top layer is called the mucosa. And it contains and secretes mucus that is rich in bicarbonate. And bicarbonate protects the lining of our stomach from acid. And um, it'll be one of our key players in our pathophysiology. So remember bicarb. Now, also in this mucosa layer, we have gastric pits. And um, in those gastric pits, there's some special cells that do some special jobs. So here we have the mucosa, and in that mucosa we have parietal cells. And the parietal cells release what's called hydrochloric acid, HCl, along with intrinsic factor, but we're most interested in hydrochloric acid, which helps play a role in digesting food. Then you have chief cells, and chief cells release a substance called pepsinogen. Now, after pepsinogen is released, it mixes in that hydrochloric acid and forms pepsin, which is another thing that you need to remember. So hydrochloric acid and pepsin, that's what we're interested in for peptic ulcer disease. And then it also has G cells, which release gastrin. Then on top of the mucosa layer is called the submucosa, and it's this layer in black. 
and the submucosa contains connective tissue, nerves, and vessels. Then on top of the submucosa is called the muscularis externica, and it's made up of three smooth muscle layers, and these Muscle layers help our stomach use peristalsis to get that food down through the digestive system. So they're very important in the role of um, they aid in digestion. Then you have the serosa, which is that outermost layer. And it is a connective tissue that connects to the organs. Now let's look at the pathophysiology in peptic ulcer disease. And to help you remember what's going on, let's look at it with the key players. And I like to put these players in two different teams because with the stomach and peptic ulcer disease, you have to have the good with the ugly in order for it to work. The good meaning that nice lining of your stomach, that does the defense work of keeping your stomach protected, and then you have the ugly, which is that toxic system that um, has the digestive juices that we have to have to digest our food to work along with the stomach and its smooth muscles to digest. So they have to exist together in order to di digest food. But there's always this fine balance between the good and the ugly, and if anything, shifts that balance, we can get ulcer formation. So let's look at the good, which is our defense system. Okay, what are the key players? One of the key players is called bicarb, and we talked about that at a little bit at the beginning. And what bicarb does is that it's secreted by those mucus cells, and it goes in and it coats and um, protects those cells that line the mucosa from that gastric acid. So the cells can exist while gastric juices flow over them. It's protected by bicarb. Then the next key player is the prostaglandins, and um, these have a very important role. They do several things. They regulate perfusion to the stomach, so we want good perfusion to the stomach so the cells can work and do their job, decrease perfusion, things can break down, not good. And it regulates the mucus to release bicarb, so it plays a role with that. And it controls the acids, acid amount secreted by those parietal cells. Now, I really want you to make a note of these prostaglandins because um, whenever we talk about the causes of peptic ulcer disease, we're going to talk about NSAID usage. And NSAIDs, how they work is that they like to block your prostaglandins. And if we block that, we're going to break down the defense of our stomach lining, which can allow that and those digestive juices to get in there and break that lining down and cause an ulcer. So remember prostaglandins. Now let's talk about the ugly, the toxic system team. It includes the hydrochloric acid, which is secreted by your parietal cells and pepsin, which once the chief cells release pepsinogen, it mixes with the hydrochloric acid and makes pepsin. And all of these work together to do digestion and they play a role with the peptic ulcer disease. Now, what happens is that we can have a villain come on board. And um, one of the major villains that cause peptic ulcer disease um, is called H. pylori, and this is a bacterial infection that gets in and it attacks the mucosa of your stomach lining. And actually, according to CDC.gov, their statistics on peptic ulcer disease, 90% of peptic ulcers that are duodenal are caused by H. pylori and 80% are gastric ulcers caused by H. pylori. So this bacteria is really causing a lot of peptic ulcer disease problems. And then NSAID usage. So these two things are really our big main cause, which we're gonna talk about in depth here in a second, that's gonna break down this defense layer of our stomach, and it's gonna allow this gastric juice to get in and erode it and just digest because that's what they do. That's the role, they digest. So instead of digesting food, it's gonna digest your stomach in a sense. So what happens? Let's say that you have the H. pylori, it's got in there and um, it's attacked the mucosa. So whenever that, those cells become damaged after penetration from the acid, histamine is released. Now, whenever histamine's released, it's like a catch-22 because your cells are releasing that because they're hurt 
and but that will signal to those parietal cells to release more hydrochloric acid. So we already have a problem with the integrity of our mucosa. Histamines release, it signals to those parietal cells to release more histamine, to release more hydrochloric acid, and then that hydrochloric acid is gonna come in and make it all worse. So um, it's gonna erode the stomach even more. Now let's look a little bit deeper into these causes. Okay, we talked about H. pylori, which is Helicobacter pylori. It's a bacteria that gets in there, breaks down that mucosa, and allows gastric acid to get in there, which will wear away that mucosa. And as it wears it away, histamine's being released, which signals to those parietal cells to release even more hydrochloric acid. So H. pylori is a common cause, and these bacteria have a unique shape to them. They're spiral shape. And this spiral shape helps them invade the mucosa to get down in there and um, cause some major problems. Now you may be asking yourself, okay, the stomach is very acidic. How can this bacteria even survive in those conditions? Well, this bacteria is very, very smart. And um, what it does is it gets in there and it produces what's called ureates. And, um, this will actually break down urea, which is already naturally in the body. And whenever that happens, it produces ammonium and carbon dioxide. Now, because it's producing ammonium, what ammonium will do will neutralize that stomach acid so it can live in there. And it will break down the mucosa of the stomach even further. So um, it's very smart on how it attacks the mucosa. Now, H. pylori, it's spread, they think it's spread um, from contamination, like maybe drinking contaminated water or getting it from someone who has it. So it's spread from oral to oral or fecal oral. Now, let's look at another common cause, NSAID usage. What does NSAID stand for? It stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are your drugs like ibuprofen, aspirin, endomethacin, things like that. And um, reason people take NSAIDs is because uh, they maybe have arthritis, they have pain, um, they have a fever. So they take this because it decreases the production of prostaglandins. And um, we learned earlier that we need prostaglandins in our stomach because it plays a huge role in the health of our stomach lining. But when you um, are having these issues like pain, arthritis, take this, it decreases that, and then those signs and symptoms go away. So that can cause that. Other causes of peptic ulcer disease is called Zollinger Ellison syndrome, and this is where a tumor tumors have formed and they secrete gastrin, which will increase stomach acid. You have those conditions, perfect place for ulcers to form. Um, other things that increase the susceptibility of developing a peptic ulcer is if the person smokes, drinks alcohol, or their genetics. And uh, one thing is that they have found that stress and food do not cause peptic ulcer disease. Instead, if an ulcer is present, stress and food can uh, prolong the healing of an ulcer or um, make it worse, but it doesn't actually cause it like these things listed here. Now, let's look at the signs and symptoms of peptic ulcer disease. Um, what are you gonna see in your patient? What are they gonna complain to you about? Um, some things you need to be looking out for. Okay, the main complaint that patients have is that they are gonna report indigestion and epigastric pain that will be anywhere from the breastbone down to the belly button. And they can describe it as feeling like a burning, a gnawing, or a dull, aching pain. Now, for testing purposes, remember this. I can remember questions from nursing school about this. Um, how a patient is gonna present with their signs and symptoms versus a gastric ulcer versus a duodenal ulcer. Okay, so for gastric ulcers, remember those are those ulcers in the stomach. Um, they're gonna report that whenever they eat food, it actually makes their pain worse. So about one to two hours after eating a meal, that's when they get their pain. However, on the flip side, duodenal, they're gonna report that eating actually makes their pain feel better. 
and um, they get pain three to four hours after a meal because patients with duodenal ulcers, an empty stomach is what um, actually causes that ulcer to hurt. So whenever they eat, goes in, sort of co coats that ulcer and um, doesn't hurt as much. Another thing with duodenal ulcers is that the patient may tell you, hey, I wake up in the middle of the night with pain. Um, that's because their stomach's empty. With gastric ulcers, normally that doesn't happen. So that's another big thing with duodenal. Um, the patients with gastric may describe the pain as like a dull, aching pain. However, duodenal, the, the patient may say it's like a gnawing pain, just something in my stomach gnawing at itself. Gastric, um, it, they tend to have weight loss. Well, why? Well, the pain is worse when they eat. So these patients may not eat as much, don't really want to eat because they have pain, so they can tend to have weight loss. Duodenal, they tend to have a normal weight. Now, with gastric ulcers, if they have a severe ulcer um, where they can maybe get some GI bleeding, um, they tend to vomit up blood. It can either be bright blood or coffee grounds. That's what you'll tend to see with them. However, with duodenal, um, severe cases, they tend to have the dark, tarry stool um, through the GI system instead of vomiting. And again, that's just due to where it's located. Duodenal is lower down. Um, from the stomach, it's going part of to the lower GI system into the small intestine, so that blood's gonna drain down to the GI system. Gastric ulcers tend to be um, in the stomach higher up, so they'll be throwing up that blood. So how is peptic ulcer disease diagnosed? As the nurse, you need to know what the physician may order, so you can be familiar with it and be able to educate your patient about what the test is. So um, a lot of times physicians may order a scope of the stomach, like an EGD, and this is where they take a scope and they go through that upper GI tract, they'll look at the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum. And they can look at ulcers, they can take pictures of them, maybe even biopsy them, so it's a good test for that. Another thing is an upper GI series, and this is where the patient will drink a substance called barium, and it will coat that upper GI tract. They'll take pictures with an x-ray, and the stomach will light up from that barium contrast that they drunk, and they'll be able to see if there's any ulcers. Another thing that can be ordered is a CT scan of the abdomen with contrast. Now, if the patient has a, they suspect the patient may have H. pylori. There are some tests that they can order, such as a blood test or a stool test where they'll collect blood sample or stool sample, test it, see if H. pylori is present. Or they can do what's called a urea breath test. And this is where the patient will ingest a urea tablet. And if H. pylori is present, it will break down the urea into ammonium and carbon dioxide. And that's what your test is gonna test the patient for. So the patient will give some breath samples and they will measure the carbon dioxide levels. And if they're high, H. pylori is present. Now, what are the complications from peptic ulcer disease? Um, be familiar with these, and in part two, I'm gonna go in depth on the signs and symptoms and things you should watch out for. But Patients with PUD, they're at risk for gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, they're also at risk for perforation of that stomach lining where a small hole will actually erode that lining. And so you have this little hole where all this, the gastric juices and everything that's in the stomach can spill into the abdominal cavity, cause peritonitis. Another thing is and cause a bowel blockage at that pylorus from chronic ulceration, usually from the duodenal ulcer. So remember our pylorus was here, it's a little muscular structure that's connected from the stomach to the duodenum. It can become scarred, so nothing will flow through that stomach and we'll have a bowel obstruction, or I mean bowel blockage. Um, another thing is that patients with peptic ulcer disease, especially when they get H. pylori, they have an increased risk of GI cancer. Okay, so what are the treatments for peptic ulcer disease? Okay, medications. A lot of times physicians will write medication for a patient. Um, these medications depend, um, what they order, it depends on the severity of what the patient has. If they have H. pylori, a lot of times they'll be started on antibiotics to kill the bacteria along with a PPI, which is a proton pump inhibitor, and maybe like a bismuth subsalicylate, sub which is Pepto-Bismol substance to um, 
decreased gastric acid, coat that ulcer, and um, antibiotics to kill the bacteria. Other drugs that are prescribed just for peptic ulcers are H2 receptor blockers, histamine receptor blockers, or antacids. And in part two, I'm gonna be going in depth into this and things you have to watch out for a nurse, as a nurse. Um, in severe cases um, that are causing complications, the patient may require surgery. Um, one type of surgery is called a vagotomy. And this is where they go and they cut parts of the vagus nerve because the vagus nerve runs down and it causes it stimulates and regulates your stomach's production of acid and they can go and cut parts of that and that will prevent it from stimul stimulating the gut to produce hcl hydrochloric acid or they can have um, a surgery called a pyloroplasty and this is where the pylorus has become scarred they go in and open it up so your food can flow or a gastric resection, and there's various types of gastric resections depending on um, which section they're removing, which part is disease, and they remove the disease parts, reconnect it, and it's usually the pyloric valve and the duodenum, what they do. Um, however, as the nurse, whenever you have a patient who's had a gastric resection, you need to watch out for what's called dumping syndrome. And this is where the stomach can't regulate the movement of food because it's missing parts of it. So since it's missing parts of it, parts of the food aren't gonna be a digest as they should be. So um, what will happen is that that food will enter in really fast to that small intestine usually the jejunum. And um, because that food isn't all the way digested as how it would be whenever it would hit the jejunum, it will act as a hypertonic um, solution in a sense where it will pull water from the bloodstream into the intestine. So you're gonna get swelling, nausea, diarrhea, and that's early dumping. And some patients can have late, um, either they have either or they can have both. And late dumping is where you know that solution, the contents that has entered into the jejunum, it's very rich in carbs and sugars because it wasn't really broken down up here because of our resection. And um, it can cause the pancreas to release insulin. And so the patient will get hypoglycemia, that tachycardia, that sweating, dizziness, things like that. Okay, so that wraps up our lecture on peptic ulcer disease. And don't forget to watch part two. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.